Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Way Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 13th of April, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So Vitalik put out a tweet today, uh, basically asking, or he said, what are some decisions or trade-offs in Ethereum protocol design that you want to see explained better? Now, there are a lot of good uh, responses to this with responses from Vitalik himself. Uh, my thing was basically replying with probably everything got to do with why the gas fees are higher at layer one, you know, what the gas limit is, how it works, why there's a fee market, why this is needed to maintain decentralization, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, Vitalik didn't reply to to my uh, tweet there. Maybe he's going to write a blog post about it because I really do think that we need uh, kind of like more and more uh, education around that. I mean, obviously, I do have plenty of it on the refuel and in my newsletter, but I think that there's still a lot of people out there who just have absolutely no idea why the gas fees are higher at layer one and why, you know, the, the roadmap that Ethereum is taking in order to, to scale as well. Uh, and then there was a bunch of other kind of people asking questions, getting replies from Vitalik with links to previous work that he had done, uh, which is which is really, really cool. I mean, I, I just wanted to highlight this because I highly recommend uh, jumping into this Twitter thread uh, and basically checking out all the questions and answers. Basically an AMA with Vitalik, right? Live on Twitter here. And uh, one thing that actually stuck out to me was this one where someone asked, you know, what? how did the number 32 ETH come to be, to, to, to be a solo staker or a solo validator? And I've spoken about this in the Discord channel before, but basically the reason it's like this is because... Um, um, it's based on this logic in this blog post, which you can read. But if the deposit size was higher, then fewer people can participate, obviously, right? Uh, risking centralization. But if the deposit size is lower, then the chain suffers a higher cost of verification, quote unquote, overhead in, in the blog post that Vitalik wrote, risking sacrificing decentralization differently. So basically, uh, you know, I, I've kind of like said this before in the Discord channel where I said, you know, if it was lower, then... It would, it would basically, uh, it could lead to destabilization of the beacon chain because there'd just be too many validators. Uh, now, as, as it kind of gets better a, a, over time, as the beacon chain gets better over time, we may be able to one day lower that amount. Obviously, 32 ETH is a lot these days, right? Like, I think when this was written, it was, uh, I think 32 ETH was, a, was um, a lot cheaper. I'm just kind of like scrolling up to the top here. Um, but yeah, I mean, w when that decision was made, I'm pretty sure ETH wasn't like... Pretty sure ETH was still in the triple digits and probably low to mid triple digits at that point. Uh, so yeah, obviously 32 ETH wasn't very much money then. And no one expected ETH to go as crazy as it did, like as fast as it did. I, I honestly, like obviously I'm super bullish on ETH, but I never expected ETH to go that crazy. I mean, we went from $80 in March, 2020 to $4,400 in May of 2021. So just over a year, we went like 40 plus X. Uh, no, one, no one saw that coming, right? Especially because everyone thought, the world was ending when, when COVID first kind of like uh, came to be. So, you know, it can kind of like be forgiven for thinking that 32 ETH was quote unquote cheap or relatively cheap back in the day. But as I said, it wasn't, um, it, the 32 ETH wasn't chosen based on the kind of like dollar amount of, of ETH. It was more like chosen, sorry, it was more chosen based on what the protocol could handle at the time. And as I said, as time goes on, as the protocol gets better, we may be able to lower that because it can, because it can handle more validators uh, there. But I mean, I, I highly recommend reading this whole thread from from Vitalik here because he links to a bunch of different great things you can read. I mean, you could spend all day on this with all the stuff that he linked to and all the rabbit holes you can basically go down. There's so much documentation out there around a lot, lots of this stuff. So I highly recommend uh, giving that a read there. Uh, and also... I mean, just keep scrolling down because like there's so many comments and answers from Vitalik. Like it's crazy. It's just buried in beneath, uh, underneath. And there's also answers from other people too to some of the questions, which I thought was really cool. So yeah, it was just basically like an impromptu AMA that Vitalik did on, on Twitter here. All right, so Tim Biko put out a tweet today that I found uh, interesting that I wrote a newsletter about today where he said, having multiple client teams for Ethereum definitely adds complexity, but boy, does it ever increase the amount of brain power we have going into this thing. I don't think it'd be possible to get so many super smart folks working on the protocol with a single implementation. And then Tim continues by saying, same thing for doubling down on rollups instead of execution sharding. No way we'd have half the teams we currently do working on scaling with a more centralized roadmap. So I want to focus on the first part of the, of the tweet here. Ethereum currently has nine different clients being developed uh, but across the consensus and execution layers or quote unquote ETH1 and ETH2 if you want to call them that, that. And each of these teams varies in size, of course. But if you were to kind of like add up all the people working on Ethereum core development today, it would be, I think, 150 to 200 people that are like actually working on Ethereum core development across uh, the, the client teams um, in actually engineering work and research work and testing and all that sorts of stuff. It's about that, right? Now, if we only had one client, like if we only had Geth, for example, uh, I think that that number would be a lot less. It would probably be less than 50, 
probably even way less than that, right? Maybe less than 20 people. And we wouldn't be able to attract a lot of the people that we've been able to attract because of the fact that everyone would be just basically... Um, working on Geth and not working on other clients in, in different kind of like languages and doing doing things their own way. For example, Geth is written in the Go programming language, whereas something like uh, Lighthouse is written in Rust uh, from memory, right? Uh, Prism is written in Go, but it's a different thing. It's on the consensus layer, right? Instead of the execution layer. So it's, there's all these kind of like things that, that add up. And I think that I t completely agree with Tim here that... Obviously, this has added complexity, but the trade-off, uh, which I think is a very good trade-off, is that we've managed to attract a lot more brain power into Ethereum, which is what Ethereum needs. Ethereum can't just get by with a handful of people uh, working on it. Ethereum requires lots of, of, of um, super smart people to work on it because Ethereum's roadmap is very ambitious. It's not like Bitcoin, where it's basically finished and they add an upgrade every four years, which basically you know is a very, very minor upgrade. Uh, Ethereum adds upgrades ideally like every six months, right? And they're major things. And Ethereum has, as I said, a very, very ambitious roadmap. So there's no way that roadmap will be able to get executed on if we only had a handful of people working on it. So I'm, I'm, I really love uh, that Tim kind of like brought this up. And also, you know, he brought up rollups, right? And the layer two ecosystem instead of what's called execution sharding, which was the original sharding roadmap. And I think this is good as well, because it means that we can have like, you know, a thousand rollups blossom on top of, of layer one Ethereum. And each of those have their own team, have their own funding, have uh, their own knowledge and specializations, building their own, you know, technology. And then, it, and then we get like what we have today, which is you know 10 20 roll up roll ups right live right now you know some of them are forks and 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 that but like there's five or six kind of like front runners like big teams that are that have got massive amounts of funding valued at billions of dollars uh, from their latest funding rounds uh, and working on absolutely amazing bleeding edge tech that actually has a lot of implications for layer one ethereum as well and helps with layer one uh, uh, there too so if you add up everyone working on layer one and layer two, uh, you are going to get to, you know, 500 plus people like layer two, the layer two ecosystem has a lot of people working on it. And, you know, maybe not on the core protocol itself, but if you were to count the, the the people working at the layer two teams that are working in community and marketing and business development, and which I think you should count those people. Yeah, there's, there's easily like 500 plus probably people working across layer one and layer two uh, in, in kind of like getting adoption to to go up there. So that's very, very cool to see. And I thought this was just a great tweet from Tim because, you know, there's been talk about Ethereum being, you know, overly complex or too complex lately. And I, I kind of like gave my piece on that a few weeks ago where I said that I think Ethereum's actually gotten simpler over time. But in terms of the amount of moving parts there is on the social side, it's definitely grown a lot from where it was. But that's just an inevitability because as the Ethereum ecosystem gets more adoption, it's going to grow and grow and grow. There's going to be much more people uh, uh, involved in it, and they go. You know, some people will be involved in core development. Some people will be with DeFi, with DAOs, NFTs. People will pick their poison, and that's just how things happen. Like we can't just remain a small Ethereum network forever. Like Ethereum wasn't just going to remain a bunch of of DGENs. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, playing around with with you know the same sort of money uh, uh, all the time. Ethereum has grown to what it is today, and it continues to grow. So very, very uh, awesome to see that, of course, but also awesome to just kind of reflect here and see that yes, you know, Ethereum may have gotten more complex on the social layer over time, but that's actually a good thing because what we've been able to do by doing that is attract all these super smart people to to the ecosystem. So I thought that was really cool. All right, so Superfizz shared a, a new kind of, I guess, look at client diversity today, uh, we basically showing that Prism's at 46% now. Now, this data I don't think is accurate. Uh, Superfizz followed this up and said, you know, this is d maybe dirty data. And this is the data that's coming from Mega Labs. So you can actually uh, kind of like uh, toggle it here. And it's actually even been updated. And now it says 60% for Prism from Mega Labs, and then you got Sigma Prime's block print, which is the thing that Michael Sproul was working on, which shows that at 51%. Look, it's it's hard to tell. Like you're you're never going to get like a certain kind of percentage here. This is just going to be an, a, a, an an estimation. But if we take you know Sigma Prime and Mega's kind of like figures and put them together, we can safely say you know that Prism's at around 60% right now, which is lower than it was the other day. Uh, which is obviously really, really awesome to see. Client diversity is objectively getting better. No, ma no matter about this exact percentage here, it is objectively getting better. And Prism just being below 66% is already a huge win, as I've explained before. So very, very cool to see this. But I do wonder why uh, you can see here uh, Mega Labs's data was was updated, and now they're at 60%. But Sigma Prime's data is at 51%, which is lower, uh, which is just you know slightly higher than um, than what this was here. Uh, it's as I said, like I, I don't know. 
it, it's hard to kind of like get the accuracy here. But it, uh, as I said, like I think you, we can have relative certainty that Prism is about 60% right now and, and falling from there, which is really cool. Now, speaking of client diversity here, this is on the consensus layer side. This is on the kind of like quote unquote ETH2 side. If we move over to the quote unquote ETH1 side, it's not looking too flash hot either. Geth is at, uh, well, no, I shouldn't say either. It's just not looking too flash hot. Geth accounts for around 83% of the network there. Now, as it, as a, as it exists today, this isn't like a do or die issue. Um, it obviously isn't ideal, but it's not a do or die issue. Post merge, from what I understand, the execution layers being this kind of like, uh, and, and Geth being this dominant is actually just as bad as Prism being, uh, you know, or, 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 a, or, a, um, or Lighthouse or whatever else on the consensus layer side, having that 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 um, 66% plus because these clients basically talk to each other and are going to be one uh, post merge. So we needed another push to basically get Geth below 66%. Now, I don't think this is going to happen before the merge. I don't think uh, it's, you know, as critical because Geth is obviously much more battle tested than any of the consensus layer clients by far. Client diversity on the execution layer side has been a bit hit or miss because we've had teams, uh, you know, fall out. Like Parity obviously was building their client for a while, then they fell out, that became Open Ethereum. And then Open Ethereum is kind of like, I think it's still being worked on, but not not in a, in a major way. Then Aragon came onto the scene, which is second here at 8.8%. But And, it, and there, obviously there's Nethermind and Basu as well, but they're not as near as mature as, as Geth. And a lot of people don't, don't kind of like really trust running these other things just yet. Uh, but they're all good clients, don't get me wrong. But I, I guess like we're going to need another push around execution layer client diversity sometime soon. I don't know when that's going to happen. Maybe it happens before the merge. Maybe it happens after the merge. But yeah, that's definitely just as important. So if you are running a Geth full node today, switch over to something else uh, to help client diversity here. You can switch over to Aragon, Open Ethereum, Nethermind, or Basu, all good clients for you to for, for you to kind of like check out and run there. But this website that I'm looking at is clientdiversity.org, by the way. Uh, so you can go check this out. There's links to everything you need to know about client diversity here, which is which is really, really cool to, to see. Uh, and speaking of client diversity, Summer Esat has put together an introductory article for a series of guys that he's working on to help existing Ethereum stakers migrate from the current majority client Prism to one of the minority clients. So this is going to be cool. I, I think this is going to be really cool when uh, when he's kind of like done these articles. You can see them here, this introduction, which is this article. Then there's going to be four separate ones from migrating from Prism to Nimbus, Teku, Lighthouse, and, and Lodestar. And then obviously a conclusion there. So I just wanted to give you guys a heads up. Uh, you should definitely go follow some of ESAT's work. He's been doing a lot of great guides for Ethereum staking for a long time now. Uh, you can see here, he had some of the first guides uh, for, for Ethereum staking all the way back, I think, when the, before the Beacon Chain even came out. You can see here, uh, November 2020. So that was before the Beacon Chain went live, a few days before there. Uh, and, he, and, and those uh, kind of guides uh, hold up to today. So definitely go check out all of his work. I'll link it in the YouTube description. All right, so Polly now put out a really, really interesting uh, tweet thread. Uh, I think... Just after I recorded yesterday's refuel and that I really want to cover here. So he starts off by saying, does EIP 4844 impact decentralization, i.e. the cost of running nodes? Yes, but not materially so. Now, background EIP 4844 is the EIP to reduce call data costs uh, in order to give rollups more scalability. Uh, so it increases sustained hard drive requirements in doing this. Note hard drive, not SSD, by around 200 gigabyte and bandwidth requirements by about eight megabits per second. The overwhelming bottleneck for Ethereum is still going to remain state growth. So he goes on to say, you know, why this is the case, why, you know, why you already need kind of like uh, uh, terabytes worth of SSD kind of like storage for state and all that sort of stuff when running consensus and execution layer clients here. Um, and then he goes on to say, yes, 4844 is, is definitely a... Um, a block size increase, but it's a relatively mild one. And uh, even that is temporary and mitigated soon after as dank sharding, uh, dank sharding rolls out as well. Uh, remember 4844 history, unlike state, will expire straight away, but doesn't have a long-term burden on the con consensus uh, uh, network here. Sorry, I should say, I, I get... I get sometimes confused with these numbers. I think 4844 is the uh, the state expiry uh, 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 kind of EIP here. If I just quickly look at up 40 EIP 4844. No, EIP 4844 is the proto, yeah, proto dank sharding EIP, with, which is the um the blobs of data, sorry, I should say, not the, um which is going to uh, allow kind of like rollups to have cheaper fees here. There was, there was another one, there was a 48, 
88 or something or f- there was another the numbers were so similar and I kept getting confused between between the two but yeah 4844 is the blob transactions that I've spoken about before which is codenamed proto dank sharding so that's what Polynar is talking uh, talking about here but I um I think this is always good to kind of like reflect on these sorts of things like yes it's going to this is this goes back to what I was talking about with trade offs this will marginal, I mean, marginally, kind of, not really, not materially so, as um, Polyna says here, affect decentralization. Yes, it's going to increase the cost of running nodes, but in return, we get massive scalability for layer twos. I think that's a pretty awesome trade-off, right? If, if you just increase the the cost of running a, a full node or a, or a validator or a consensus kind of like node or anything like that by a, a non-material amount then and, and to get that kind of like extra scale layer two, it's just a no-brainer to me. Like I, I don't see a negative to this. It's kind of like, so, so for example, going with the gas limit, right? If we were to go from like a 15 million gas limit to 20 million gas limit, I think that would impact decentralization a lot more than what 4844 would do. And you wouldn't get anywhere near the amount of scalability gains you would uh, uh, with kind of like increasing the gas limit that you do with 4844. So I think taking that into account, it's a good trade-off to have. But definitely check out this this tweet thread from Polynar. I'll link it in the YouTube description. Uh, it's it's pretty good to kind of like get across this sort of stuff because this is going to be the main stuff that's talked about after the merge, I believe. It's going to be all about that Shanghai upgrade and all about getting these AIPs in that help with layer two scalability uh, as part of, I think the surge is what it's called on, on Vitalik's roadmap, which is basically getting, you know, all that scalability for layer twos in order to finally get those fees down to subcent transactions. All right, so Arbitrum uh, retweeted K- 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 U coin or KuCoin today and said deposits and withdrawals on KuCoin for the Arbitrum 1 network are now live. So another exchange is now live with deposits and withdrawals. I used to use KuCoin in back in the day before DEXs had a lot of liquidity and things like that. So I'm not sure who uses them these days. I used to use them to trade shit coins, which you can now do on Uniswap. So you don't need to, to use the centralized exchanges. But if you are on there and you're a regular user of them, you can now use KuCoin uh, to deposit and withdraw ETH, USDC, and USDT to the Arbitrum 1 network, which is always a good thing to see. You know, you guys know that that I'm, I'm all for centralized exchange bridges into layer twos. They're critical to the layer two future and it's exactly what we want to see. So definitely go check this out if you're a KU coin user. I keep switching between KU coin and KuCoin. I'm just going to say KuCoin. <laughs> All right, so Maple Finance, uh, which is a project I've spoken about before, but they basically uh, do institutional kind of like grade uh, uh, loans, and and, and they basically they basically build themselves as an institutional crypto capital network, um, and obviously they're on Ethereum. So you can kind of like see today they've announced a partnership with Maker, uh, and they're kind of like calling this partnership a way to scale the digital co- uh, digital economy. So this partnership would see Maker's D3M module and Maple's Pool Delegate model and Smart Contract Kit combined. So this is more on kind of like I guess the um, the developer governance front here and you can kind of like see how this is all going to work uh, and, and how this kind of like can work with, with Maple and how they can all work together. I'll let you guys give it a, a give this a blog post a read here. Uh, but this is very cool. I, I like these synergies between DeFi protocols. Like I'm always a big fan of them. And I think, you know, Maple Finance in particular, which is a project I, I remind you guys that I'm a seed investor in. So just a disclosure there, that's why I've been following them so closely. But they announced the other day that they're actually profitable, which is crazy. Like I, I forgot to cover this the other day, but uh, yeah, in this blog post, they said Maple turned a profit in Q1 2022, attributable to the increased appetite for under-collateralized lending from new and old borrowers across all pools. And you can see kind of like um, the details of this here in the treasury report. There are not many DeFi protocols out there that are actually profitable, like net profitable. You know, there are some that will say they're profitable, but they're actually paying for that through kind of like token inflation and things like that and massive kind of like token inflation. But you can see here the Maple Dow's quarterly profit and loss is they made $226,000 of, of kind of like profit in, in Q1 here. Whereas like all these other quarters here, you can see that they didn't make anything like that's in brackets means that they, they kind of like lost money there. I think this is super cool. Like, I think we need to be encouraging teams like this and we need to be supporting them because at the end of the day, a lot of these DeFi protocols are businesses. I mean, pretty much all of them are businesses. And if they can't turn a profit, well, I mean, and if they're subsidizing growth of their token, their token is just going to go to zero like over the, over the long term. And I spoke about this yesterday about how this is another thing you have to kind of like uh, factor in when evaluating a token is like, how is the protocol paying for growth? Are they just paying out their token and putting sell pressure on their token in order to subsidize growth? You know, are they profitable? Do, you know, do they have long-term sustainability? Is it sustainable without token rewards, without liquidity mining, all that sort of stuff there. So that's something I forgot to cover the other day that's that's relevant to here. But 
I definitely get, give, recommend giving this post with Maker and Maple a read to see what this is all about. I think it's very cool. And as I said, I've been a big fan of Maple a long, for a long time, seed investor in them. You know, the funny thing is, like, I remember meeting the Maple founders in Melbourne for a coffee. It would have been early 2019, I think, uh, while I wasn't even working in crypto at that point. Uh, and I was just crazy. Like, they were talking about it back then. So they've been hard at work at this for a while now. And their protocol has been growing so well lately. Um, and uh, and kind of like they're, they're doing a lot of really cool things and they're profitable. I, yeah, I, I, well, Maple is one of my favorite projects. I know I haven't spoken about them in a little while on the, on the refill because I don't like to shield the projects I'm invested in too much. Uh, I don't want to, to basically, because they have a token. I don't want to basically say, hey, go buy the token or anything like that. But yeah, Maple is one of uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm I'm most excited about because they're definitely serving a need um, on the institutional side of things. You know, I don't know if you'd call them like true DeFi because they're like with institutions, they're kind of like acting as a um as a as a kind of like a, a bridge into or a service uh, with the kind of like the rest of DeFi. But uh, you know, they're definitely uh, doing a lot of good work. So, so kudos to them. But definitely give this blog post a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description. All right, so Nomad, which is a cross-chain communication protocol, announced today that they have raised a $22 million seed round led by Polychain with participation from 1KX, Ethereal, and Hack VC here with you know a bunch of kind of like funds and angels participating as well. Now, the reason I laughed there when I said $22 million seed round <laughs> is because this means their valuation from what I saw is like $250 million or something for a seed round. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with funding rounds, a seed round is like normally one of the first rounds that is done. There are like, you could have pre-seed and like friends and family, but seed round is usually kind of like that big thing. Like you might get a pre-seed round for just as kind of like uh, get, to get a bit of money in just to prove out the concept. And then you go and raise a seed round and seed rounds normally are not $22 million and 100% definitely not usually valued at $250 million. So that's crazy there. Uh, but I mean, congrats to them on raising this. I mean, that's an amazing amount of money to raise for a seed round. And I'm not picking, I'm not trying to pick on them or anything. There's been plenty of uh, really ridiculous rounds in crypto. I've participated in some of them as well. So I'm not one to talk, but it's just funny how like these valuations are so high uh, in, in the private market. They're still high. I thought that would come down by now, but they're still high. But enough about that. Uh, Nomad, as I said, is another cross-chain kind of like communications protocol, another bridging protocol. I believe they're working closely with Connects on a few different things. Which is which is really cool to see. Um, obviously, their goal is to make it make you know cross chain stuff as easy as possible. Doing you know cross chain exchange, message passing, all that sort of stuff. There, you can read more about their raise in their blog post, of course. Um, in terms of like their tech stack, I'm not sure how much they've they've kind of like put out on their tech stack. Um, there's been one blog post about their design philosophy, which I probably highlighted on the refuel back in the day. So you can give that a read as well if you're interested in learning more about Nomad. But yeah, it, I mean, it seems like all these VCs and angels and things like that are very confident in in kind of like um, in Nomad, in their technology. And at the end of the day, like I've said before that I'm really bullish on bridges in general. Maybe, I don't know, cross-chain. I'm more bullish on multi-chain stuff, which is basically Ethereum and the L2s. But regardless, you're still going to need that bridging infrastructure and, and, and things like that. So you Nomad... Know, uh, applies to layer twos as much as it applies to other networks and things out there. So cool to see them raise this round to continue building out their their vision for what a cross chain world can look like. All right, so Polygon announced today that they have gone green. So they've uh, unveiled something called the Green Manifesto, which is a smart contract uh, with Planet Earth, apparently. And you can see all the details here. I believe they've partnered up with uh, Klimadao for for this, uh, and uh, or, or, or are kind of like working with them. And they've pledged up to twenty million dollars to take immediate steps to offset the ecosystem's environmental footprint entirely. So this is the blog post here where you can read what this is going on about. I, I, I believe that, yeah, I, I saw Klima was in here somewhere. I'm not, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm blind here. Yeah, Klimadao, yeah. So so Klimadao is going to be working with them to kind of like do stuff like analyzing the Polygon Network's energy footprint and supporting its emissions management and, and mitigation strategy, which is very, very cool. I mean, I, I think this is just really overall cool because Polygon, I mean, already is uh, very environmentally friendly because it's a POS chain. It's, it's not a, PO, a POW chain, right? It doesn't use mining or anything like that. Uh, but they want to go further than that and they want to offset basically everything or, or as much as they possibly can across everything that they're doing, which I haven't seen any other proof of state network do or, or kind of like attempt to do 
or speak about. So I'm hoping that Polygon's kind of like initiative here actually um, uh, uh, pushes this forward, right? And and starts a trend here because that's just, yeah, super, super cool that they're, they're doing this. And the way they're doing this is that Polygon is buying, or this is the first step, is buying $400,000 worth of high quality and traceable BCT, which is the carbon credit tokens from Climadel uh, and carbon credits as well, are the equivalent of roughly 90,000 tons of CO2 emissions. Polygon will then selectively retire the offsets with the carbon token pools. They meet the highest standards for additional additional and positive environmental impact. Very, very cool. I love this. Uh, I know Klimar, I spoke about them a while ago um, and I did warn against people getting involved with uh, their kind of like token and stuff because it was like an Olympus fork and the token did what I thought it was going to do, which was kind of like bleed out, unfortunately. It, it, that's not a comment about the project itself. I think the project's doing a lot of great stuff. But uh, yeah, at the time, there was so much hype around it and everyone's like, oh my God, you know, this is going to be the next thing. And then obviously Olympus collapsed. It's still there, but like the price went down a lot. Uh, and then Treasure and Wonderland and all that sort of stuff. Not Treasure, sorry. Um, Wonderland uh, collapsed and and, and 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 things like that. So yeah, uh, I, I don't make co any comment about kind of like uh, the token price, what that's going to do anything with Klima, but the project itself, I think is still very, very cool. They're still kind of like committed to their mission. They haven't gone anywhere. It's not like it was a, it was a scam or anything or a rug pull. Uh, and they're working with Polygon now, which is just really awesome to see. So definitely check out this full manifesto, this blog post. If you want more details here, and you can check out the website as well. Both will be linked in the YouTube description. All right, so Nifty Island has announced something today called Palm Dow, which basically uh, is a DAO that's going to be acquiring the best NFTs, putting them in and putting them in the hands of the community and creating game-ready assets around them, playable in Nifty Island and other game worlds. So you can see here, uh, Palm Dow, there's just kind of like a splash, splash screen here, or I guess um, a coming soon website here uh, with a bit more details. You know, what is what is Palm Dow? They describe it as something to push the metaverse forward by collecting the best NFTs and Dow members are able to utilize those assets in Nifty Island and in other ga game worlds. Now, the cool thing about this is the way it's kind of governed is by Palm holders. So there's these kind of like NFTs that they uh, that Nifty Island issued called Palms. I own one of the neon ones. Um, they're very, very cool. And the kind of like Palm holders basically get to get to govern this and get to kind of like play around with it uh, and things like that. So very, very cool uh, that this kind of like came out today and very cool it was announced today. I uh, I really like that they're trying to push the kind of like space forward here with NFTs, Nifty Island. Like you guys know I've been a fan of Nifty Island for a while now. Uh, but yeah, if you want more details on this, uh, definitely go check out uh, uh, kind of like the side and the Twitter thread. And these are the projects that they're, that they're supporting right now. Uh, obviously, you know, the Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, the Idols, which is one that's becoming very popular lately, I believe. Stuff like MFs. Uh, tubby cats, you know, cool cats and maladies, which Twitter blew up about for some reason and I didn't get it, but yeah. And then a bunch of others. I mean, th these are all pretty high quality uh, NFT projects, I think, uh, from, from what I can see here. These are the ones that I see talked about a lot, um, especially obviously you know, bored apes and stuff like that. Regardless of what you think about them, they've got massive communities. They're doing a lot of stuff. They're actually executing on their roadmaps. Uh, maybe, maybe I don't know about, about MeBits though, because MeBits is obviously a Lava Labs thing. And it's curious that CryptoPunks is in here. Man, I don't follow NFTs much, uh, but it's funny how quickly CryptoPunks fell out of favor because of the fact of Lava Labs not doing much with it. And then Lava Labs sold to uh, Yuga Labs, which was uh, the, you know, the people behind Bored Ape, Yacht Club. And yeah, I haven't really heard much about CryptoPunks. Like I'm not saying I'm bearish on punks or anything like that, but it's just funny how they kind of, for now, have lost lost the cultural kind of like attention war in the NFT land. Um, I think that's for a, 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 a number of different reasons, but I'm no expert on NFT, so I'm not going to bore you with um, with the details there. I'll bore you with my speculation. But yeah, just funny to see that they aren't on this list here. Maybe they will be in the future, but, uh, but yeah. Anyway, definitely check this out. I'll link it in the description. All right, lastly here, my second talk that I did at Blockchain Week is now live for you to kind of uh, have a have a, a gander at. So this was my one with Kane Warwick. We basically talked about, mostly about DeFi and Ethereum and, and things like that. It was it was quite a fun talk. It was the last talk of, um, of the Melbourne event here. So if you're interested in that, you can definitely check it out. It'll be linked in the YouTube description. Um, but I think that's going to be it for today's episode. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.